Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the last of the North Dakota Reclamation webinar series. Glad you could take the time to join us this morning. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items before we get to our speaker. First off, uh, the webinars will be recorded and posted at uh, NorthDakotaReclamation.com. And we encourage you to go back and take a look at those if you have uh, interest in that. During the webinar, feel free to use the chat to discuss amongst yourselves. But if you have a question for our speaker, please use the Q&A to ask question and we'll um, get, get to those either during the presentation or at the end when we will have time for questions. As always, uh, we provide service to all citizens of North Dakota, and that's our non-discrimination statement. So with that, we will introduce today's speaker. Today we have speaking for us, uh, Bill Cease. Uh, Bill uh, obtained his degree in geology and geophysics from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. He spent 16 years as an environmental consultant in the Midwest and Northern High Plains region before joining the North Dakota Department of Health Groundwater Protection Program in February of 2014. And I've had the pleasure of working with Bill in that role and also as in his current role as Spill Investigation Program Manager, which he assumed in August of 2015. As with that, I will turn it over to Bill Cease. All right, thank you, Carl. Good morning, everybody. Yes, welcome to this last presentation of the conference. Um, yeah, my name is Bill Cease. I'm, I'm the manager for the Spill Investigation Program for the North Dakota Department of Environmental Quality. And my goal here today is to talk to you a little bit, or I should start out by saying it should be interesting because anybody who knows me will know that when I do these kind of presentations, I tend to move around an awful lot. So we'll, send, we'll see how I can do just sitting still here and not trying to talk with my hands too much. So I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about the one thing that a lot of people doing a cleanup just view as that necessary evil, something they have to do, and that is sampling. But what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about today is how sampling can actually do a couple of things for you. Not only can it save you time, it can also save you money. And also by doing a proper delineation and starting off at a slow pace, you can actually, in the long run, save yourself time and move faster. What I refer to as go slow to go fast. So the question comes down to what do I mean by go slow to go fast? Well, I liken it to a big cat, in this case, a leopard, who basically is going to go through this long, slow stalk. And what that leopard is doing is she's setting herself up to get in the best position to put on a burst of speed and complete a task. In this case, in her case, it's bringing down probably a gazelle or something like that. Um, but her goal there is to go very slow. So in that long run, she can expend the least amount of energy in bringing down her prey. Well, a leopard spent expending energy is kind of like you doing a cleanup and spending money. It can be associated with the same thing. If you take the time to go slow, in the long run, you can expend the least amount of energy or spend a less amount of money. So how, do you, how does that work before putting on that burst of speed? Take the time to properly delineate a site, determine where the contamination is. If you can't really clean up a site or you can't do anything until you know where it is. And also just as importantly, find out where the contamination isn't. We don't wanna be having to clean up areas that don't need to be cleaned up. Proper delineation allows you to determine the most efficient method of remediation, to do a more thorough remediation, to save time, and more importantly, to save money, to expend that least amount of energy to complete your task. So all of this requires sampling. So there are certain types of sampling. There's delineation, kind of referred to already. There's also confirmation sampling and there's monitoring. And we'll touch up base on all of these as we move forward. So why, why do you sample in the first place? Well, it's common sense. You know, you're gonna start off, you want to, you've got to clean up to a certain you know, level. You have to show that you've cleaned up to that level. It's peace of mind or otherwise known as covering your own backside. 
It basically gives you that documentation to prove to, to anybody at any time, you know, in the future that yes, you properly cleaned up the site. Here is my proof of that. In many cases, it's required for you to sample, that, especially that confirmation sample. Um, and then in the end, and the part reason for this uh, presentation is that it can save you money. Now, I know what you're thinking. Most of you are sitting there going, nah, sampling doesn't save you money, it's just expensive. Yeah, how, how, how can I do that? And yes, yes, you can. And anytime I can work in a Phineas and Ferb into my presentation, it's, it's usually a good thing. So, so how can that work? I have had producers tell me it costs them $3,000 per sample to do any sampling. Um, this being a family show, I won't tell you what my response to that was, but yes, you can make, you know, make it work for you. So what I want to first look at is the delineation of the site, and that's going to be our primary focus. So imagine, if you will, and know what I'm about to tell you does not come out of the twilight zone. This is realistic. We're trying, looking at, you know, realistic scenarios, and in some cases, actual spills that we're doing. I just like this slide. So imagine if you will produce water spill. It's tank overflow, it really doesn't matter what the cause of the spill was. But on a well pad, it flows off the well pad. Your flow width is about 12 feet wide. Your flow, flow path length is about 450 feet long. It's an area's rangeland and there's no surface water involved. And it looks something like this. So it pulls up in the corner of the well pad here it makes its way through the berm and then travels down a fairly steep hillside into this lower area where it continues to flow and then ends up pooling up down here. Fairly common scenario that we see. We've got an area in here that was obviously fill. We've got an area here that's probably more native. And we've got an area down here where you can tell it's a naturally high sulfate area. So you've got a couple of different uh, uh, landscapes you're looking at on this. So, so we're going to be, like I said, as, as I go through this, I'm going to be making some assumptions. I'll try to tell you where all my assumptions are that I make. Um, and one of the biggest assumptions in this is I'm going to be only looking at that upper foot. Okay, so when we're doing an excavate, when I talk about the excavation, the costs I'm going to give you and everything is going to be dealing with the upper foot as will my delineation, as we'll only deal with the upper foot. As you delineate deeper, you excavate deeper, your costs are gonna go up you know, on both, probably at a similar rate. So that's one of the first assumptions I'm gonna be making here. So what is the cost to excavate? Well, you got a potential impact area of 600 uh, square yards or 200 cubic feet per depth. Now I talked to a number of different uh, producers to try to get what's the cost to dig and haul, how much to excavate and dispose, mobilize to the site, what's the general. I got a wide range of responses back, anything from $65 a ton to $800 to $1,000 a ton. It's a, a kind of astronomical range. Most of those fell into that $65 to $150 per ton range. And I decided to go with the $65 a ton range because the producer who gave me that number spelled everything out very clearly that it, it involved the mobilization to and from the site. It involved one excavator with one operator. It involved one truck with one truck driver and that the landfill was fairly close to the site. So we'll take those assumptions. We'll make this a best case scenario and say it's $65 a ton. We'll assume about 1.5 tons per cubic yard, basic average of earth density, and then giving us a total cost of $19,500 per foot of depth for your excavation. Keep that $19,500 number in mind. So what's the cost to delineate? Okay, so again, I'm gonna be making some assumptions here. I'm gonna be ma making the assumptions of a single environmental professional, it is fairly close to the site, within an hour of the site. And what I'm looking at is <clears throat> the cost of that environmental professional to mobilize to and from the site, 
to collect the samples on the site and ship them to the laboratory, the laboratory costs, and then basically delivering those results you know, to for that laboratory, the environmental professional to deliver the results to you. I'm not including costs of uh, any fancy reports or anything like that. It's all very simple. So we're looking at one sample for roughly 100 feet, 125 feet in this case. So we're looking at four samples, two background samples, and I will show you why, two background samples in a little bit. Cost per sample, we're looking at diesel range organics, gasoline range organics, because you can have a uh, crude oil hydrocarbon uh, component to produce water. You're looking at the electrical conductivity of the EC, the SAR or the sodium absorption ratio, and chlorides. You could sample for more, but this is the minimum of what we'd like to see you sample for. Talked with a number of different chemistry labs to get a generalized cost per sample, and we came up with $137 per sample to sample all of these. Total laboratory cost will be $822 for your six samples. Cost for environmental professional to collect the sample, again, it's gonna be a wide range. Um, I was a consultant for a number of years. Uh, I kind of calculated out, what would I have charged to do this? Again, being fairly close to the site, within an hour of the site. Came up with $600 for that. Total cost, $1,422 to do that delineation. And that's gonna look something like this. We would like to get a sample of where it came through the berm. And remember, I'm only focusing on the off pad impacts here. So we're gonna, we wanna sample up here, basically you make sure where it came through the berm. This is a fairly steep hillside where it's coming down. We wanna sample flowing through that to see what kind of impact we had there. This is that transitional pit spot, we want to get a sample there, and of course down here we're pooled near the end, plus we've got a background. So we're running again through this area, this transition area between the fill and the native, so we want to capture something similar to that. We could capture it up here, there's a number of spots we could, and then this is that higher sulfate area in this naturally occurring area, we want to make sure we're capturing something in that as a background. That's why I went with two backgrounds. Now, one of the things we, we do see with saltwater spills that flow down steep hillsides is that they have the ability to flow over that hillside so fast that they don't soak in and do much damage on the hillside. So when you get your sample results, you may find something that looks some, like a little bit like this, where you have impacts here where it's soaked through the berm. This and down here were impacted, but this in this steeper hillside is more like your background samples, or maybe there's some slight impact there, but well below our cleanup criteria. So maybe we can ignore, you know, not have to do too much with that spot. So now we're going to go into a second phase of delineation. And yes, I am doing a very in-depth delineation in two phases. Not everybody is going to do that, but this is the most, uh, the best way to really capture everything you need to capture with the least amount of sampling to do it is to do it in two phases. You can do it in one and save yourself a little bit more money, but what you save in the mobilization, you'll tend to spend it in more samples. So, but based on the phase one results, additional sampling, to do additional sampling to zero in on those impacts, I'm gonna assume 10 additional samples, okay? Um, that may sound like a lot, but in reality, it's really not. Cost per sample, so one of the things I should tell you is one of our, when we got our first set of samples back, we did not find any petroleum hydrocarbons on it. We're gonna make that assumption. So now we don't need to sample for those. So we're just gonna look at the electrical conductivity, the sodium absorption ratio and our chlorides. We get a cost of $80 per sample. That's the laboratory cost on those. So a total laboratory cost, 10 samples, $800. Your environmental professional, again, we're making those same assumptions. Okay, we're taking 10 samples rather than six, a little longer on site. So we're gonna go $700 for that. So the total cost of $1,500. Again, we're only looking at that upper foot. We're gonna keep it similar to our excavation on that. So that's gonna give you something like that, where you sample kind of, you wanna get a good delineation around where it soaked through the burn came through, so you get that. You're trying to get us a, a bracketing of this clean area, a bracketing of this 
impacted area delineated here around where it soaked in. Okay, so, so what are we gonna look at? So total sampling cost, $2,922, we'll call it 3,000, round it up, all right? So what did we save? Well, that's gonna depend on what you can, how much of that area you can eliminate. If you eliminate 20% of that area, you're gonna save yourself $3,900 in excavation costs. Well, you spent 3,000 on the, on, the on the delineation. So you'll have saved yourself $900. All right, that may not sound like all that big a savings for you, but add 5%, so you get 25% removal. You're gonna more than double your savings on those uh, over your excavation costs on it. Little point, little side note on it. Like I said, I'm looking at uh, Diggin Hall as your remediation, another option for remediation on these. Um, in the case of a hydrocarbon impact might be thermal desorption, which is basically excavating it, treating it on site. Uh, my look, checking on that, I got costs of anywhere from 55 to $65 a ton on that, depending on gas availability and what you need. Um, so we're looking at some similar savings on uh, doing over thermal desorption on something like this. So, so as you see, the more you can remove from your site, the more money you can save on your remediation, your excavation. So now let's look at camp confirmation sampling. Uh, hey, I know, you know, you think you, confirmation sampling, how do you save money on that? That's just showing what we cleaned it up. Well, in most cases, that is the truth. It, it's, this is the one that's gonna be required most time. Verify you cleaned it up. This is your proof that you did do the cleaning up. But there are times when it can save you money. So this particular company spent a lot of time and money excavating a site in 2012. It's about a two and a half acre site. They did a lot of digging on it. They dug down about eight feet. They hauled away the old soil. They brought in clean backfill, put in topsoil, seeded it. Five years later in 2017, it looked like that. It was still barren or it was barren again. So what happened on this particular site? Well, it was improper confirmation sampling. They did do and collect a couple of confirmation samples, but three samples over a two and a half acre site, um, those confirmation samples actually did show some impacts being left behind. Um, in 2012, it's amazing what we've learned about produced water spills um, and how they react and how salt water re reacts with the ground and groundwater over the years. In 2012, we were still kind of naive on things and we thought at eight feet, I think that isn't gonna to do too much damage. But impact in soil and groundwater were left in place. Um, impacts migrated back to the surface through capillary action. Capillary action in soils in North Dakota and a lot of these tight soils can easily pull up five to six feet. And then the plants can pull everything up even further than that. So although the, re the revegetation on this site was initially successful, the vegetation soon died off due to re-impacting of soils. Um, so there again, a better confirmation sampling could have shown them that they still had impacts left there, needed to do more work before they backfilled everything and spent and wasted all that time and money. Also, we tend to get a lot of situations where they've done the excavation, they go and they collect their confirmation samples, send them off to the lab and then backfill immediately, um, only to get their lab results back saying that it hasn't been cleaned up thoroughly. Then it's either redig the stuff or find a way to justify leaving it in place. And that justification would be to go through a risk assessment. Um, and so we'll get into the risk assessment as part of the monitoring in here in a little bit. But for confirmation sampling, what's gonna allow you to do is not to have to redig a site. You won't have to, you know, if you do a proper confirmation sampling, it's gonna show you've done it and you don't have to redig it. You don't have to dig more than you have to by doing a proper confirmation sampling. If you got a hundred foot by hundred foot excavation and you collect one confirmation sample and it comes back dirty, well, the assumption you just made is that the whole bottom of that excavation is dirty. And so you've got to go and dig more from that whole excavation. 
Or if you've taken five or six confirmation samples across the, the, the bottom of that, and only one comes back dirty, well, now you know you've only got one little area that you need to continue digging on. It also lets you verify that you have met the cleanup criteria. It gives you that peace of mind. It gives you that documentation that you've done the work successfully. And now I'll get into monitoring. So how can monitoring save you money? Well, a robust monitoring plan can be part of a risk-based assessment that allows you to reduce the amount of remediation required. And that's a kind of a big mouthful, but basically it is, you have the ability to do a risk-based assessment on things. And by looking at what is the risk of leaving contamination in place, will it impact? What will it impact? You know, we can do that, but you need to do proper sampling for, in order to do that. So we're gonna look at a crude oil spill remediation. This was an actual site. It was a spill into farm, into agricultural land. Um, it was a big site. And after digging quite a bit, they did a lot of remediation on the site. And then the company asked for a site-specific risk-based cleanup criteria. The company provided a bait and transport model, and it showed that the crude oil would naturally attenuate before it could reach the ground wall. The focus was the benzene on this, and that they showed that benzene would naturally attenuate, would break down, would, would would not actually impact groundwater. Groundwater at this site was 150 feet deep, but there was also a uh, intermediate perched uh, aquifer, shallow per at about 35 to 40 feet deep uh, that you, we saw in some areas, didn't see in others. Uh, but they were their focus was that that deep groundwater that deep groundwater aquifer. The company agreed to quarterly groundwater monitoring for five years, and they were given a site-specific cleanup criteria of 1,500 parts per million total petroleum hydrocarbons. They had asked for 5,000, um, but as I but they were given 1,500 because of that shallower uh, aquifer, the perched aquifer at, at 40 feet. That was not a very deep one, but. So groundwater monitoring included quarterly monitoring for five years. We had 18 monitoring wells that they were looking at. We had nine sets of monitoring wells, one going deep into that deep 150 foot aquifer and one going into that 40 foot aquifer. They surrounded the excavation. They were sampling for, for total petroleum hydrocarbons of, of diesel range organic and gasoline range organics. Now, in this particular case, the company does sample for more than this um, because they choose to for uh, comfort of their own. And it was what they agreed upon in a consent agreement in the legal document. But this would be the minimum that we would you know, want to see in this particular case. Um, this site had much, had a lot of other cleanup, we, you know, a lot of other monitoring and sampling throughout it. It was a four year cleanup. Um, so we had plenty of detail, so we knew this was all we really needed on it. So what's the cost of that monitoring? Well, we got a laboratory analysis for diesel range and gasoline range organics at $57 per sample. Uh, laboratory cost for per sampling event will be $1,026 for the 18 samples. Cost for an environmental professional to collect the samples. Again, I don't know what they're actually spending, what their environmental professional charges them. I'm just looking at what I would have charged as a consultant and I came up with $2,600, giving us a cost per sampling event of 3,626, five years of quarterly sampling, 20 sampling events, sampling costs of $72,500. That's a lot of money. And, and maybe you know, you're gonna do more, you want more, you want BTECs in there, or you think that it should be higher. So let's even say $100,000 know, for these sampling. Um, you know, it's gonna be, how do you just say that's saving you money? Well, due to the complex nature of this site, we cannot quantify exactly how much was saved. Then remember, we, we set it to a dig to 1,500 rather than a dig to 100 parts per million. So it's like we can't say def, you know definitely say how much was uh, you know how much they didn't have to dig up. Also, this particular site was fairly tight clays, 
with sand and gravel seam that ran everywhere through it and the the crude oil which tracked through these sand and gravel seams it was really hard to target exactly how much but the company does believe that the more lenient cleanup criteria easily saved them over $1 million in remediation costs. And that was the cost of the thermal desorption that the on-site treatment they were doing. In reality, it probably saved them several million dollars in remediation costs. So would you spend 72,000 you know, or $100,000 to save yourself one to two or more million? Yeah, you would. So it's a good play on their part. So in conclusion, on this. I can't promise million dollar savings on every remediation. Hopefully your, clean, your spills are small and don't need one million dollar cleanups. But in many cases, the delineation and confirmation sampling will save you money. Okay, monitoring plan as part of a risk-based assessment can potentially save money, uh, can potentially save you even more money. And you cannot complete a rest-based assessment without a thorough delineation. So in that scenario I talked about earlier, that they did the excavation, they collected their confirmation samples, they backfilled, and now their confirmation samples came back that they still had impacts. Now they wanna justify leaving them in place. Well, that's doing a risk-based assessment unless they know what the how deep that delineate how you know unless they did a thorough delineation that they know it doesn't spread out wider at depth they, they know it doesn't you know how deep it goes we can't do a risk-based assessment so do the delineation take your time go slow go fast and you know you can save yourself money in the long run I kind of blew through that a little bit faster than I did in my training or my practice sessions, but um, I think I covered everything, but I'll open it up to questions at this point. Thanks, Bill. So we do have uh, one question, and that relates to using uh, field screening uh, parameters and equipment to uh, um, further guide your excavation. So uh, what field screening parameters and test equipment supplies do you feel are beneficial to help guide excavation real time while sure. excavation is underway? Okay, uh, field screening, yeah, uh, is, is a great tool to guide your, your excavation in this case. In case in the one I showed, it was uh, uh, produced water, it was salt water spill. Um, you can use electrical conductivity to help guide your, your excavation. But as you saw in the map I put up, we're going into two, two different areas. We got that first area coming down the hillside and then we're getting into that higher sulfate area. Now to keep in mind that that higher sulfate area is going to have a higher electrical conductivity on its own. That's why you want a, a separate background sample in, the same, in that area. So you'll have to be also looking at that as you do your electrical conductivity. Um, a, probably a better field screening tool in that situation would be a the chloride test strips that are available. Um, the little the little Quantab strips. What you do is you there is actually a, a documented method out there, but you're going to be placing the soil in in some water, shaking it up, letting it sit for a while, either letting it settle the the sediment to settle out or filtering it through a filter. And then you use the chloride test strip, the Quantab strip, to, to measure the amount of, of, uh, 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 of I'm totally blanking on the chloride in, in the uh, water. And that will give you a good indication on that. And so those are tools you can use. Um, a PID, a photoionization detector, is a really good tool to use for petroleum hydrocarbons. Again, you got to go through the proper methods on that. You want to collect your sample in a bag, you wanna let it warm up either in the sun or you know, in the cab of your truck if it's a cold day to allow that those hydrocarbons to start to volatilize. Now the higher the range, when you're looking at gasoline range, PIDs work really well. Diesel range, they start to have some limitations. You get into your motor oil range or your, or your, your you know, asphaltics, they, they don't work well at all on that. So um, 
So those are, but those are definitely tools you can use. They are great for guiding your uh, excavation, but they do not suffice for confirmation sampling. Uh, we do have a question regarding the risk-based assessment. What are the key receptors we'd like to identify to ensure a proposed plan is comprehensive enough? Sure. Uh, that's going to depend on your location, but we definitely want to look at uh, water bodies, creeks, lakes, rivers, uh, stock ponds, anything like that. We want to look at what's out there. Uh, we want to take into account any other utilities or pipelines running through the area that can stuff can track along. Um, pipelines are fab fabulous preferential pathways. Uh, we've seen you know, spills start to migrate one way and turn and take a 90 degree turn as they track along a pipeline corridor. Um, also any like potential houses that have basements, water wells, there's stock wells or, or drinking water wells, anything like that. Any, anything that could, you know, their contaminant could flow into. And again, as far as the distance from the site, that again is gonna be determined based on your your soil profile, your the volume of your spill, um, just, you know, and will will dictate the distance to it. Anything else? Yeah, we have another question here. Uh, can you share what regulatory parameters you aim for in North Dakota regarding EC, SAR, and sodium chloride? All right. So and then our second part to that, but I'll let you tackle that first. Okay, so we do have. For, um, for produced water spills, we do have our guidelines that have been published. Um, and they're, they're primarily based, we do have some you know, tight numbers. We have the 250 uh, parts per million chloride that's based on its ability to impact water. Um, otherwise, you're looking at prim prim primarily trying to clean it up as close as we can to background. On the site. So usually for sodium chloride, it's 250 parts per million or background on the site. And then electrical conductivity, we would like to see that um, four, at a, four at a maximum, we'd like to see that down around two. Again, it's going to be dependent on the, the situation you're in, whether you're in agricultural land or whether you're in rangeland. Uh, the native grasses can tolerate a little higher ECs than a lot of your crops can. Um, so that's that. And then there was a part two to it. Yes. Uh, and then, well, also uh, SAR values. And then are these uh, federal or state specific? Okay. SAR values, um, again, we'd like to see a minimum of 12 on that. Again, it will be dependent on the, the area you're in, whether it's rangeland or cropland. Uh, when we get into cropland, we're going to look at it more specifically to the crops that are being rotated through that field, use it. And then um, this is, that particular one is state uh, specific. Um, there are not too many federal guidelines out there for, for produced water. All right, additional question. Um, would the DEQ and perhaps NDSU consider additional formats, blogs, on specific topic uh, to share reclamation related information in addition to the conference. Certainly. It's, yeah, I, I think against that too, definitely we'd be interested in providing um, additional opportunities like that. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thanks Bill. Again, uh, just a reminder, the recordings of the, rec of the uh, presentation will be online and we uh, hope we can all gather together uh, for next year's reclamation conference. So uh, thanks everybody and uh, have a good day. If you have any additional questions, my information's right there. Mm -hmm.